<clears throat> All right, welcome back to the Atlanta Child Murders. Uh, this is video number 37. It's now 8 July. And we're going to get back into this um, FBI document. I wanted to back up a little bit and recap some of this stuff. Um, so we're just going to go back to the time when Wayne Williams um, was observed and spotted and stopped. All right, so it says approximately time 2.53. Now, don't forget that at 2.50 is when the police, rec the police recruit heard the body hit the water, okay? So upon stopping the aforesaid white Chevrolet station wagon, a black male exited the vehicle from behind the car's steering wheel. No other individuals were observed in the vehicle. The black male walked to the rear of the driver's side of the station wagon and the SA identified himself uh, and the patrolman to the driver. <clears throat> the still unidentified black male immediately inquired, what's this all about? The special agent asked for identification from the black male and he produced a driver's license which patrolman took to his car. At this time the black male who identified himself as Wayne Williams of 1870 Penelope Road, Atlanta, Georgia again inquired what this was all about. A special agent advised Williams he could not say at this time. After a pause, Williams stated, I know, this must be about those boys. Blank asked Williams what he was doing out at this time of the night. Williams stated he was in the area trying to contact Cheryl Johnson, telephone number 9347766, <coughs> who lived in apartment F. Spanish Trace Apartments, which was northwest of I-285 in the vicinity of South Cobb Drive. Williams was asked by the special agent why he was trying to contact her at this time in the morning, and he replied that he wanted to find out where she lived so he could return later that same day to talk with her regarding the entertainment job with the company he was associated with, Nova Entertainment Corporation, Atlanta, Georgia. Williams advised that he was self-employed photographer and was Vice President of Nova Entertainment Corporation 3140 East Shadow Lane and that's Atlanta, Georgia. That's that office that I've shown you up in Buckhead there. That <clears throat> my mom incidentally worked right around the corner. Alright, let's see. And uh, let's see, he said uh, also known as Southern Media Corporation he advised he recruited talent for the talent agent for the talent agency and they primarily handle bands, singers, etc. And of course, none of that is true. They recruit people, they audition people, but they never he never put together a band, he never cut a record, he never took anybody <coughs> signed any group, put them on tour, put them in a club, recorded an album, nothing. He stated he wanted to contact Johnson about a possible singing engagement. S.A. asked Williams if he would allow his car to be searched, and Williams gave his permission. It should be noted that Williams was initially nervous, exhibiting shaking and nervousness in his voice. However, after one or two minutes of questioning, he became composed. William advised he had failed to contact Johnson and had proceeded south on South Cobb Drive near the Chattahoochee to Starved and Marvin's gas station um, and convenience store at Bolton Road and South Cobb Drive. Wilson continued by stating that on his way to Starved and Marvin's he stopped at a liquor store just east of the bridge and picked up a cardboard box in the vicinity of the liquor store. He continued on to Starved and Marvin's and placed a telephone call to Johnson's residence from a payphone across from Starver and Marvin's. He was unable to get an answer and picked up another cardboard box at the area and returned to I-85 via South Cub Drive where he was stopped. At this time, S.A. began shining a flashlight in Williams' car inspecting the contents in the car from the outside. Special agent observed two cardboard boxes and a bedspread, white with black and green design, in the back portion of the station wagon and two 
brown paper grocery bags in the in the rear seat of the passenger side. Now, <clears throat> when he's shining the flashlight, because of the reflection on the glass, this um, white blanket is actually yellow. And you'll see this in the uh, when we're doing over that uh, FBI fibers. That's the yellow acetate blanket. That's the one he uses to wrap the bodies up. And it says, uh, while looking into the car, S.A. told Williams that the car was a mess and it looked as if he had some animals in the car. Williams replied they had a dog in the car and S.A. inquired what kind of dog. Williams advised the dog was his parents' 14-year-old German Shepherd and it had been in the station wagon on several occasions. So when Williams didn't have a victim in the car, he usually had the, the German Shepherd in the car there. And that's left all the dog hairs. So and the German Shepherd would usually sit in the passenger seat in the front. And so whenever any of these victims got in the car and they sat in the passenger seat in the front, they picked up these German Shepherd dog hairs. It says, during further discussions with Williams, in which at some point patrolman Blank returned from his vehicle and roving FBI supervisor Blank arrived on the scene, Williams advised the special agent <coughs> of the following. Brink, uh, number one, a friend of his, Jim Comento, had previously interviewed, interviewed regarding the murders of the children. Jim Comento works part-time at Nova Entertainment Corporation. So, Jim Comento is one of his business partners at the studio there. He owns the green station wagon that... Uh, we read earlier that Wayne Williams was seen loading equipment into. Also, the green station wagon was spotted near or with some of the victims who were spotted getting into the green station wagon driven by either Jim Comento or Wayne Williams. This is why Jim Comento was stopping because I believe someone got a tag number off the green station wagon and they were able to trace it to Jim Comento. They went and talked to Jim Comento about the police did early on about the uh, the children of course he denied everything I'm gonna do a special video about him and what I can find on him there's not a lot out there but I think Jim Comento along with Jimmy Ray Payne uh, this other guy that Wayne Williams is hanging out with and um, and uh, and Nathaniel Cater. So these guys, these four, and maybe even this other guy that I saw at the Dipper Dance, were all part of Wayne Williams' crew. Okay, he had different groups of people he hung around. This is his main Gemini crew that he hang out, he hung out with, and this is the group that was involved in the murders. Some of them, or if not all of them, either participated or knew about the murders. This is why he's going about eliminating all of them, okay? He would have got to Jim Comento, but the police got him before he got, before he got a chance to get rid of Jim Comento. This is probably why Jim Comento, I think he left Atlanta because he was scared of Wayne Williams, even though Wayne Williams was arrested. So it says, Williams stated he was getting the cardboard boxes for the band equipment. He later advised he was getting the boxes for uh, that for books is that his mother owned. So he changes his story. You also see him change his story when he's brought into the FBI office. Williams was going back on I-285 to pick up a tape recorder. He also says that he had picked up the tape recorder earlier that evening at the San Suchi Lounge, which there's no tape recorder in the car. In 1970, the white Chevrolet station wagon um, that Williams was operating belonged to Williams' uncle, Ralph Barnhart, who resided in Columbus, Georgia, and who can be reached at telephone number 689-6380. Williams advised his uncle lets his father use the station wagon. And don't forget that Homer even testified in court that Wayne Williams had been sick all night, the previous night, 
and that according to his log that he brought a written log that Homer Williams had the car the white station wagon up to one o'clock in the morning which couldn't be true because when Williams is seen with the white station wagon at the San Suchi Lounge and the Rialto Theater right around midnight all right so keep going so I'm also gonna do one on Homer Williams because there's something very strange going on there with Homer Williams and um, you know I wouldn't be surprised Homer Williams was born in 1913 so he's very old he's about 66 when the murders start happening and I'm sure if we check some kind of police records in Columbus in 1930s we're gonna find something about Homer Williams there anyway so we'll keep going on here it says um, Williams advised that the two brown paper grocery type bags in the rear seat were his and his mother's one bag contained his mother's clothes while the others contained his basketball clothes Williams stated he played basketball um, played on a basketball team for Schlitz beer and um, SA SA observed long dark colored pants in the bag and asked where his basketball shoes were he advised he did not have them with him and they were at, at home at his home he stated he did play basketball in long pants yeah sure why not everybody plays basketball in long pants in hot muggy Georgia at the end of end of May makes sense to me I did want to say also one thing that I just came upon that Wayne Williams is a Gemini his crew that he's hanging out with I haven't got all of them but are almost all Gemini's when he's interviewing people and auditioning people he's only keeping people in his crew called Gemini that are Gemini's um, Nathaniel Cater was born on May 20th so that almost makes him a Gemini Gemini starts on May 21st okay he's killing he's picking up Wayne um, excuse me the Gemini sign starts on the 21st 22nd around the evening of the 21st um, they're using the old Babylon calendar which basically starts at it's like the Jewish calendar it starts at sunset on the 21st and goes into the full day the first full day on the 22nd okay I <clears throat> it's very strange that he's a Gemini he's auditioning people for his group called Gemini his crew of people including Jim Camino uh, Nathaniel Cater, Jimmy Ray Payne are all Geminis are very close to being Geminis and he's killing Nathaniel Cater on the first day of the Gemini of 1981 so it's very strange I don't know if it has anything to do with it but I was just looking at the dates and I just happened to notice very very strange we're going to go over on another video a Gemini personality and you can guarantee that Wayne Williams read up on that and tried to act like like that and I'll go over the, those things later on but I just think it's very interesting that on the first day first full day of the Gemini calendar he's killing another Gemini Nathaniel Cater although Nathaniel Cater is really born on the 20th I think it's the 20th maybe the 21st it's kinda sketchy there on the dates but again I'm sure if we check Jim Camino and all these other people they're probably all Gemini's although I looked at Jimmy Ray Payne and I don't think Jimmy Ray Payne is Gemini and I think he's killed like in September or something but this Gemini thing whether you believe it or not it doesn't really matter what you believe it only matters what Wayne Williams believes and if Wayne Williams believes that this Gemini thing is real and that it has something to do with how he's killing these people and why he's killing these people that's all that matters is if it matters to him because that's going to give him motivation to do things anyway it says 
SACs and electrical wire wrapped in blue plastic that consisted of one section approximately 30 inches long and the other section approximately 16 inches long. When seized, the wires were lying on the shoulder of the road approximately one foot behind Williams' vehicle rear bumper. Now, don't forget, this is where Wayne Williams, he got out immediately, walked to the rear bumper, and the patrolman saw him drop something. This is approximately where Wayne Williams was standing. Patrolman observed the wire and mentioned it to the SA. At the time, patrolman brought the wire to the SA attention. Williams stated something to the effect that he wanted patrolman and SA to remember where he was when they first observed the wire. This is prior to SA's arrival. So he's at a different location now, and the wire's over at the rear bumper where he was at. So he's trying to distance himself from the wire. This is the wire he used to kill um, Nathaniel Cater. I don't think it could be one. It may or may not be the one that killed Nathaniel Cater. I personally think that he had a wire at home or some kind of rope at home that he was using to kill the individuals. All right, we'll keep going. It says, during this questioning, Special Agent asked Williams why he stopped on the bridge. Williams advised that he not, did not stop on the bridge. S.A. asked Williams why he was driving slowly on the bridge. Williams denied driving slowly on the bridge. Now also, just to remind you, that Homer Williams is at the courthouse when Wayne Williams is just arrested and um, or shows up there he's talking to another individual in the news media and <clears throat> the guy recognizes him and says hey um, Homer what are you doing here he's taking pictures and he goes oh well that the person they just arrested Wayne Williams is my son um, they arrested him for littering. He told me that he had dropped off trash over the side of the bridge, and so they arrested him for littering. And then the guy said, oh, well, Homer, maybe I shouldn't be talking to you anymore because, you know, I don't want to know anymore. So, obviously, Wayne Williams told his dad that he stopped on the bridge and threw trash off because why would Homer Williams say that to an individual, another news reporter, in casual conversation so obviously he did tell people something he did tell his dad something he did tell the agent something all right so one thing I've learned from reading all these documents in the JFK assassination is I always go with the initial report okay so in the case of JFK You've got witnesses. Witnesses, they come up to the police and say, hey, I saw a barrel out of the sixth floor. I saw a man run across, you know, the back railroad tracks, whatever. And they tell the police this. And the police will bring them over to the police department or the sheriff's department. And, I mean, if they believe them. And they'll fill out an affidavit. Now, the one thing you have to remember about witnesses, especially in such a large crowd, is <clears throat> you may have 20 people come forward and give a statement, but there may be 100 people that actually saw things and important things, but may not realize they're important. Okay, so there may be, out of 100, only 20 may come forward and talk to the police, okay? Again, it's like the sales funnel, and we'll do it something like this. So let's say you have 300 witnesses in Dealey Plaza. Okay, out of that, only 60 may come forward to the police. Okay, out of those, maybe only 55 the police will care to talk to and take their affidavit. So the, you'll read all these affidavits written at the sheriff's office, which basically the person says something to a court reporter they're typing it up they read it over they agree with it and then they sign it saying yeah that's what I saw that's what I heard those are gold those are always your best initial things because people 
haven't had time to be influenced by the media. They haven't had time to be uh, spun by the the defense attorney, the district attorney, the sheriff's office, the Warren Commission, whatever. So all the initial reports are usually the best. And then from those, the FBI is going to look through all these affidavits and they're going to go back and re-interview people, okay? And then they're going to put in their report. Now the thing about that, though, is that in the initial affidavit, the person that signed this, had read over it and si said it, read over it, signed it, and agreed with it. In an FBI report, it's only what that agent says that you said. You don't get a chance to go back and correct that special agent's report. So it can be biased. They can leave things out. They can add things. So you'll see this difference between and I've seen it many times between the original affidavit and what the FBI special agents report is like what we're reading right here okay I'm not saying they lie I'm just saying sometimes the FBI agent has an agenda of what he's looking to get out of the witness so he'll only ask certain things and he'll only write down what he thinks important okay and then in the JFK assassination, there's even more to these. Because so you'll have those, and then all these FBI reports are being sent to the Warren Commission. Not all of them. They're filtering those on what the story they want to tell. So all the FBI reports that indicate something else was going on besides just Oswald involved in the assassination, they leave out, and they only include the FBI reports to the Warren Commission that implicate Oswald in the assassination. So it's selective, you know, filtering of if even the FBI reports. And then when the Warren Commission gets it, they've got an attorney that's like a district attorney that's calling witnesses they want to question. So he's reading through these FBI reports and then he's filtering. He's only pulling FBI reports and requesting and sending out um, what he called these uh, not warrants but uh, anyway he's sending out requests for these people to show up with at the Warren Commission and testify that justify the story and the narrative they're trying to tell okay and then they'll get them and testify and then the questioning will only be on a certain slant they're looking at you can tell it so, and then the the Warren Commission will take these these testimonies and only put in, and then put a narrative on top of those. Maybe they'll put in sections of that testimony, not all of it, in the initial report in the beginning, and then you have to weave through the <coughs> sixteen volumes, whatever, to find their entire report. So then when you read in the Warren Commission someone's testimony, it might be considerably different than what their initial testimony was in their affidavit at the Sheriff's Department, if it's there at all. So I'm not saying that the FBI is lying in this special agent's report about Wayne Williams, okay? Because they have no reason they have no agenda right now to frame it in a certain way but it is interesting that they put out that Wayne Williams told them in the news media that he stopped on the bridge and he dropped trash and then Wayne Williams since then has said no I never stopped on the bridge I never dropped any trash but then his father said Wayne Williams stopped on the bridge and dropped trash before the FBI puts that out so he had gotten that from his son. That's what his son told him. But here, the special agent, in the initial report, this special agent, not the special agent in charge, but this roving in charge agent, but the special agent says, during this questioning, the special agent asked Williams why he stopped on the bridge. Williams advised he did not stop on the bridge. So the 
this even the special agents report is backing up what Wayne Williams is saying you know 40 years later special agent asked Williams why he was driving slowly on the bridge Williams and I driving slowly on the bridge of course it this testimony counters what the patrolman saw is that somebody had stopped and he didn't notice them until after the body hit the water and then when the body hit the water then he looked up saw the cars crank up the lights come on so the person obviously stopped and dropped something and then slowly drove off the bridge <clears throat> Williams denied throwing anything off the bridge Williams advised he was not the only vehicle on the bridge and that he observed two vehicles white and blue in color which he believed were small trucks at a self-service station at the area of Starvin Marvins and believe they belong to Pure Later. He advised they were on the bridge when he was proceeding northwest on South Cobb Drive just before being stopped. So he's confusing the situation. They're talking about when you were going south east and he's talking about seeing the Pure Later whatever trucks at the Starvin Marvin and then on the on the bridge going northwest. At this time Roving supervisor arrived at the scene and began interviewing Williams uh, in SA. And you're going to see his report after this, guys. Because this is the special agent that initially, that was in the chase car that initially stopped Wayne Williams. See, each one is going to write up their own report. And how you can tell what's real is where they, you know, they meet up and there's no difference. And began interviewing Williams in the SA vehicle. A short time before SA arrived, Captain Blank and an unidentified uniformed patrolman arrived on the scene and were briefed by the SA and patrolman regarding the events that had taken place. So you have a captain with the Atlanta Police Department, and he's arriving because he's got one of his patrolmen out there. He needs to find out what's going on. So it's the patrolman supervisor. All right. Okay, we'll keep going. Hold on one second. Got to forgive my voice. I've got some kind of allergy that's um, draining into my throat, and it's really fucking up my voice. So I've been taking all kinds of medication to get rid of it, but it's still there. Um, so, you know, forgive me the way I'm sounding here. But approximately, at approximate time 3.30, so this is about... 37 minutes after the initial stop. SA departed the area after advising roving supervisor of the facts um, that were known of at the time and advised him he was going to pick up recruit. So this is the um, academy recruit that was under the bridge that heard the splash and return and have him look at the station wagon. SA departed the area and returned with recruit. Upon arriving on the scene, a recruit advised, that's the car. Special agent asked if he was sure. Recruit then reiterated that he was sure the vehicle he saw driving slowly in the bridge uh, heading towards him and then turned around and proceeded toward SA position was this vehicle. Now you got to remember this concrete barrier, unlike now, back then was about thigh high just a little bit above your knee okay so if you take <clears throat> your knee or your just above your knee around around your thigh and stand on the street by a 1970 white station wagon you're gonna see from the door from like the middle of the door up that's how he was able to see it also it turned on its lights and it was the only vehicle there upon returning on the scene roving supervisor advised he was going to contact someone to determine what should be done with Williams Supervisor departed the area. S.A. talked with patrolman, captain and recruit supervisor and returned, advised that Williams was to be released after obtaining identification data regarding Williams. So, unless they had a body, unless there was blood all in the car, or a bloody knife, or drugs, or weapon, something they could hold Williams on, you got to understand the laws back in 1980 were a lot less strict than they are now. 
they couldn't hold Wayne Williams. Okay, the, even though they had an Atlanta police officer, it was an FBI operation. Wayne Williams had violated no federal laws. He had violated no state laws or local laws, except maybe littering. So there was nothing they could hold Wayne Williams on. They couldn't even confiscate anything of his property. And here's the reason why. Anything that they had confiscated without a charge, without a warrant, without a, a legal reason, if it was brought to court and tried to be used in a case, could easily be thrown out. A lot of people say, well, if they saw this, if they saw that, why didn't they confiscate it? Well, they did get the wire that was on the ground. Anything in Wayne Williams' car, you can't get into. You, you, you can't confiscate that. I mean, they could if they wanted to, but they couldn't ever use it legally in court. Okay? So, at 3 in the morning, they're calling their SA the special agent in charge of all the FBI office in Atlanta. He's on the phone with his legal team at 3 in the morning. He's probably on the phone with the DC headquarters and their legal team. And they've got no legal constitutional reason to be able to hold him. So they have to let him go. But he's in their sights now. They got him. Why is he there? His story doesn't work out. Now they just got to figure some way to get in his house. Some legal reason to get in his house. Okay. They don't have a body. They don't even know that Nathaniel Cater is gone. Okay. It's only been like two, three hours since he was last seen. They know something's up. They know that Williams threw something over the bridge. And they're out there that night in boats and that morning in boats but a body is going to be heavy with bone and it's going to go sinking right into the water and you know if you've ever been to Georgia you got that red clay it's almost impossible to, to look further than, than 12 inches if that so the body probably went is sitting there on the bottom when decomposition starts to set in it starts to put gas in the body and float it and then with the currents that's pushing it downstream and that's where they found the body two days later. Now there, there's these reports supposedly of people seeing Nathaniel Cater later that morning, a day later, two days later, but no one ever talks to Nathaniel Cater. They see him in the distance. They see him at a, a bus station. They see him at the Marta stop. No one ever goes over and talks to Nathaniel Cater. Okay, and I, I'm not trying to sound racist, but you know, a lot of black males from a distance look very similar. It's not like white people with blue eyes and red hair. Okay, there's just a limited range of identification of someone who's black. Such a young black male, seeing them from a distance, oh yeah. I saw a guy that looked like Nathaniel Cater. You saw a guy. You never talked to that guy. Okay? So, you're going to have people that have come out. This is why I'm saying that, you know, you got all these people citing all these, these three people that said they saw Nathaniel Cater. They never talked to him. Okay? And witness testimony is notoriously wrong people see things that aren't there and don't exist and the body according to the, the coroner was killed that night so there's no way unless Nathaniel Cater's ghost was running around that they saw Nathaniel Cater everybody has a doppelganger I can't tell you how many times friends of mine came up to me and said oh yeah I saw you at the Omni yeah I saw you at Linux and you were running out the door, you were going in the game room, but I didn't get a chance to say hello to you. And I'd say, when was this? And they'd say, you know, Friday at 2 o'clock. And i no, no, Friday at 2 o'clock, I was working. You know, and I always used to make, make a joke of them. I'd say, hey, well, 
thank God you didn't see me killing somebody, right? Because I have an alibi <laughs> like that. And so everyone has someone that looks like them. If you go to another city, if you, if you took all the white males and lined them up, you're going to find another person or maybe two people that look just like me in Minneapolis, in New York, in Los Angeles. Everybody has a doppelganger because there's a limited range of physical characteristics that people can have. And those combinations come up and you have 300 million people, you're going to have people that look similar to you, especially from a distance. All right. So these people were mistaken. It's the science that matters, okay? And the coroner knows the decomposition rate in water, and he can count that back, and he puts that back to the time of murder of about 1 to 2 in the morning, which is right before Wayne Williams is heard throwing something off the bridge. And again, you got to wonder... Why is Wayne Williams killing Nathaniel Cater? Let's not forget that Nathaniel Cater used to live right down the street on Verbiana from Wayne Williams. He could walk there in five minutes. Nathaniel Cater lived right upstairs from Latanya Wilson. Nathaniel Cater was seen and identified as one of the two men involved in the uh, abduction of Latanya Wilson out of her apartment. He was standing, he was seen by neighbors standing by the car, a 1970s white station wagon. Another uh, male was identified coming out of the window of Latanya Wilson's house or apartment, carrying Latanya La Wilson. They thought she was asleep and talking with Nathaniel Cater at the car. Nathaniel Cater lived at that apartment until he moved downtown a month prior to the um, the Falcon Hotel on Lucky Street. Okay? Nathaniel Cater was often seen at the Cameo Lounge okay on West Peach Street which is one street over from the Suchi Lounge I'm sorry um, that was on yeah that was right down the street from the Suchi Lounge where Wayne Williams even admits that he went to that night to pick up the tape recorder. Let's not forget that the first, the second victim, Alfred Evans, was last seen at the corner of Ponce de Leon and West Peachtree approximately one block over from the Cameo Lounge and the um, Suchi Lounge, but he was last seen two years before. Okay. And let's not forget that right across 7585 Highway was Techwood, okay, where another victim, I believe his name was Mathis, was last seen and kidnapped and killed. So he's right in the same area. Nathaniel Cater also worked at the Rialto Theater downtown a couple of blocks from the Lucky uh, Street Hotel, the Falcon and was seen as he was getting off work at approximately a little bit after mid between midnight and 1 o'clock okay, on the 22nd. It had just turned the 22nd, the first day, first real day of the Gemini. He was seen by a co-worker of Nathaniel Cater's getting off work, walking out, and holding hands with Wayne Williams. The man specifically remembered it because he thought it was odd that two men were holding hands. And he looked at the man and he identified him later because he saw him on TV as Wayne Williams. And let's not forget the fiber evidence connects Nathaniel Cater as being on the bed he had the purple uh, violet acetate fibers on his clothing at the Falcon Hotel when they searched the Falcon Hotel. Okay? 
So that means he had a prior relationship with Wayne Williams. He'd been over to Wayne Williams' house, come back to the Falcon Hotel, and change clothes. And he had these violet acetate fibers on his clothing at the Falcon Hotel. So that all happened in the last month because he had just moved to the Falcon Hotel within that month. Let's also not forget, hold on one second, and here it is in black and white. <clears throat> You got Nathaniel Cater right here. There's the dog hairs. That means he was sitting when Wayne Williams picked him up downtown, was holding hands with him at the Rialto. They went back to Wayne Williams station wagon. They got in Wayne Williams station wagon. Nathaniel Cater got the dog hairs from his German Shepherd Sheba that was coating the passenger seat on his body. He went back to Wayne Williams' house he laid on the purple uh, silk looking violet bedspread in Wayne Williams uh, bed. Wayne Williams killed him there, rolled his body onto the green carpet where he absorbed the green carpet fibers on his body and his clothing. Then rolled him up in the yellow acetate blanket put Nathaniel Cater in the back of the station wagon drove him up to that Jackson Bridge there and then dumped the body, went down to the Sarver Marvins, turned around, never made the phone call and never got the boxes there. He had got the boxes someplace else and maybe made the phone call someplace else. And then was stopped by the police after they heard the splash. So don't be confused by people's testimony. Testimony is completely unreliable. I mean, how many times, I guess, have you seen people's testimony conflict? Just think about your own relationships that, you know, your wife sees something a certain way, you see something a certain way, and you're fighting about it. You're both seeing the same thing, but you're fighting, you have you're both saying you saw different things. Why is that? Because the human mind, like I said earlier, filters things according to its upbringing, its cultural upbringing, and its religious beliefs. And so you see things differently. This is why we can have people, 80 million Americans, voting for a complete obvious liar and seeing that he thinking that he does no wrong when it's so obvious to the other 220 grown-up adult Americans that Trump is a complete liar people filter reality we don't all see the same thing we see what we want to see according to our beliefs not according to the facts this is why I literally don't take serious any witness statements unless it ties in with the fiber in the forensics first priority is always DNA second priority is fiber and forensics and then witness testimony and it's only if it's tying in to what the fiber and forensics is saying because witnesses are horrible Witnesses can be influenced to say things. Witnesses can be mistaken and not be lying, just be mistaken. Okay? Again, an African-American male, a young African male, uh, male from a block away could look very similar to many other African-American males. A white guy with blue eyes and red hair a block away you might you might catch me on that one okay you get an Asian guy a Chinese guy with black hair and black and brown eyes from two blocks away is gonna look like any other Asian guy unless he's super fat or super skinny or super tall I mean I hate to say it but that's just the way reality is okay like I was saying before, when I was in the military and we had our 
platoon photo, which you know, platoon is so you got what 200 guys in a a company. A platoon's about 50 guys, and you got them in, on about five lines. All our hair hair is shaved off. We're wearing BDU caps, and we got our camouflage green uniforms on. When I got the photo and sent it to my parents. It was hard for me to even pick out myself in the photo. Okay? So, because they all look the same. We're uniform. That's why we wear a uniform in the military. That's why we all march in unison. Okay? But anyway, well, witnesses are mistaken. They can be mistaken. They make mistakes. Anyway, we get back to the document here. Hold on a second. All right. Upon returning uh, on the scene, roaming supervisor advised who's going to contact... Oh, anyway, so I started off with they're trying to decide whether to keep Williams. They have no legal reason to keep Williams. They have no legal reason to keep anything in his car. I mean, think about it. If you got pulled over, okay by the police for not using your signal. Do the police have the right to search your car? No, they don't. Do they have a right to pull you out of the car and arrest you? No, they don't. Unless you're, you know, if they see a, now if they pull you over for not using your turn signal or broken taillight, this is why they're always wanting to do that in fishing, okay, is if they pull you over and they see through the back window, there's a big bloody glove back there or a big butcher knife with blood all over it or there's two bags, two kilos full of cocaine in the back seat. Yeah, then now they have a reason to get you out of the car and search the car, okay. But if they just pulled you over for a broken tail light or not using your signal all they can legally do is give you a ticket and send you on your way they can pull your driver's license if they pull your driver's license and find out you've got warrants all over the place they can definitely pull your ass out of the car and search the car okay probable cause if they don't have probable cause they have no reason to arrest Williams they have no reason to confiscate anything any evidence whatsoever that's to protect us as citizens It's the fourth amendment people so these people that run around saying well if he committed those murders couldn't they smell a dead body in the car no you know he would only been dead maybe an hour at the most there was no decomposition setting in and they said well if they saw a murder weapon why didn't they confiscate the murder weapon well it's his property in his car they can't confiscate anything in his car, okay? Because it's, I mean, think about it. If you got pulled over for a broken taillight and the cop's going to give you a ticket and the cop sees, I don't know, maybe you've got uh, a hammer in the back seat with no blood. But say you just got a hammer back there. And you say, what's the hammer back there? Oh, I, I use it uh, when I go to work. Well, I'm going to confiscate that hammer. You can't confiscate my property. You have no legal right to confiscate my property. Or he sees a phone in the back. That's not your phone? Well, that's my sister's phone. I'm going to confiscate that phone. Unless he got a report about a stolen phone somewhere, an iPhone, he can't legally take your property. This is the same situation, same constitution, just 40 years later, our rights don't change over time. Well, they do a little bit, but the rights generally say the same. So it says, at this time, the unidentified uniform patrolman asked special agent if the vehicle had been searched. Special agent advised the vehicle had been inspected from the outside, but no one had entered the vehicle to a, uh, do a detailed search at this time. The aforesaid identified patrolman turned to Williams and asked if we could search his car. So the special agent had gotten permission but didn't search the car. So now the uniformed policeman, different jurisdictions, is going to ask for permission 
to search the car. Williams says yes. Williams advised it was all right with him. The reason he's advising, he's saying it's all right, he knows there's nothing incriminating him inside the vehicle. He's already taken out that cord and dropped it at the back of the vehicle, so they're not going to find it in the, cor in the car. Okay. The special agent advised, uh, searched the driver's side of the station wagon while the identified patrolman searched the passenger's side of the station wagon and the following items were observed. Located on the driver's underside uh, front seat, one torn large size men's jockey's underwear which were covered with dirt, grease, oil, etc. Located in the back seat, passenger side, two grocery bags. One bag contained men's clothing, one colored possible black, black pair of pants, one black leather loafer, shoe with approximately two inch heels, one long sleeve, one light colored shirt, <coughs> exact color unknown. The other grocery bag contained ladies clothing. Um, appeared to be that of a woman whose build was heavy and short. So right there tells you that Nathaniel Cater wasn't in the back seat, okay? Because it says located in the back seat on the passenger side, okay? So unless those bags moved, when Wayne Williams was making left-hand turns, the body of Nathaniel Cater was in the back where the gate opens up in the back of the station wagon, and that's where we'll find this blanket or sheet. Let's see here. Um, dun, 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 we'll keep going. Stature additional clothing was in both bags as both bags were fill, filled nearly to the top. However, additional descriptive data cannot be recalled. So, he's not writing this stuff down as he's coming across it. What he's doing is he's, he's going through it, he's trying to remember it, and then two or three hours later, he's back at his typewriter looking at his notes and typing this up and trying to remember it by memory. So people make mistakes, even special agents, okay? So then they're going to miss things, misquote things, but I'd rely on a special agent any day over any other witness because they're trained observers and trained to remember things to write down. Anyway, located in the rear portion of the station wagon behind the rear seat, one bed spread, large size, not from a regular bed, white with green and black pattern design. The bed spread was thrown in, was in a thrown position, no blood stains were observed. So this is the blanket or the sheet that he wraps the body up in. Okay? Two cardboard boxes. No markings were noted approximately two and a half feet by two and a half feet. Additionally, the vehicle's wheel well, motor compartment, glove compartment, and undercarriages were checked by the special agent and the unidentified uniformed uh, patrolman. Upon completing the search of the vehicle, Special agent advised he was going to the bridge and contact recruit regarding the activities he witnessed. Approximately 3.55, S.A. departed the area in his assigned vehicle and interviewed recruit at his assigned surveillance location regarding his observations and actions. When special agent departed the area, Williams was still being interviewed. In conclusion, Williams advised during the... Um, oh, and also... Let me just let you know this, that, so this is like a Friday night, Saturday morning. The special agent, roving special agent in charge, immediately after this um, stop, didn't go back to the FBI office. He went home, took a shower, changed his clothes, and then drove to Ch uh, Chattanooga in his interview, he said and spent the weekend with family there and then <clears throat> a couple of days later like on Monday or Tuesday he returned back to his office because he got a call from Washington I think like Monday said go back to your office immediately we want to read your report and then he types up this report from memory 
from two days before or three days before so anyway take it take it that what you will in conclusion Williams advised during the interview was especially that he would shoot photographs overnight and print them wait a minute in conclusion Williams advised during the interview of Williams by a special agent that he would shoot photographs overnight and print them the following day he advised that he took these photographs from his, for his company Nova Entertainment now Williams also says which counter counters what his father said okay Williams says that he went down to East Point about 930 with a group of people his Gemini crew and sold some photos to a music studio or somebody down there and that is confirmed by the interview of that guy and then returned home whereas his father said that Williams had been sick all evening okay and that had um, he had the car until one o'clock in the morning so somebody is lying there the following information was obtained through observation and interview Wayne Bertram Williams 1870 Penelope Road Northwest Atlanta Georgia 7948980 uh, date of birth May 27th so you see right there he's a Gemini because Gemini starts on the evening of the 21st 1958 and um, I believe Kimento was a Gemini I, bl I don't think Jimmy Ray Payne was a Gemini and um, Nathaniel Cater was born on the 20th 21st 1954 so he was also a Gemini or very close to being a Gemini or <coughs> he'd be a Taurus like me approximately uh, 180 pounds okay it says on his driver's license 155 now the people that say oh Nathaniel Cater was older uh, it doesn't matter Nathaniel Cater was only 5'4 and 140 pounds and if you have a body laying on the inside of a station wagon and you pull them out by their feet or pull them out by the head you can do easily take the arms throw them over your shoulder and do a fireman's carry everybody I don't know if anyone has ever seen a fireman's carry, but basically, is you take the guy and you put his body over your shoulder, balancing about where his stomach was on the top of your shoulder, and then you just go over to the railing and roll him off. So all this bullshit about oh, Nathaniel Cater was older and bigger. No, he wasn't bigger. He was 140 pounds, and he was only 5'4" matter of fact let me see hold on one second let me just verify this yeah I don't yeah I don't I didn't have this typed up here but see <clears throat> he was born 20 May 1953 he was 27 years old and this thing about the weight and the height of these older adults okay let's take a look at that real quick because this seems to be they're all caught up on this about oh he's killing these young kids but now he's taking on these older adults well let's just take a look at that okay Eddie Duncan <coughs> was only 21 years old he was 5'9 just one inch taller or two inches taller than Wayne Williams but he was 140 pounds 40 pounds lighter than Wayne Williams okay there's Larry Rogers Larry Rogers is 20 years old he was 5'1 Wayne Williams was six inches taller than him and 70 pounds more. Larry Rogers was an adult, but he was a small guy. We got Michael Mickey McIntosh. He was old. He was the same age as Wayne Williams. But look, he's four inches shorter than Wayne Williams and, a, and approximately 60 something pounds lighter than Wayne Williams. 116 pounds, skinny guy. Jimmy Ray Payne was two years younger than Wayne Williams he was six inches shorter than Wayne Williams and about 43 pounds lighter than Wayne Williams 
okay? And then John Porter wouldn't have any information, just that he's 28. William Barrett was 17 years old. He was 5'4", about three inches shorter than Wayne Williams, and then about, you know, what is that, uh, 30, 50, 56 pounds lighter than Wayne Williams, okay? Same with Nathaniel Cater. I think Nathaniel Cater was like 5'4", 140 pounds. So, yeah, these guys were older. They weren't children, but they weren't much bigger than Wayne Williams. So don't let them fool you into thinking that, hey, how could, okay, if he killed the kids, how could he have taken on these big older adults? And you'll see also that some of the adults he had to stab. Okay, here, I'll, I'll bring it up. John Harold Porter, he had to stab him because he was 28. William Barrett, he had to stab him because he was 17. Okay? And then there's another one here. Anthony Carter. Anthony Carter was like seven years old, I believe. So don't let them confuse you or fool you by saying, oh, how could Wayne Williams kill these older adults? Some of them were older than him. Yeah. But Wayne Williams is five foot seven inches and 180 pounds. He's a much bigger guy. Okay? And again, you don't have to be really big to do a fireman's carry, or they call it the buddy carry in the, that we learned in the Army. And Wayne Williams would have learned this in his ROTC. It's called the buddy carry in the fire department. He, was in the, he helped in the fire department. It's called the fireman's carry. And basically, you go into a burning building. You throw the person's body over your, sh over your right shoulder. You balance it with your right arm and then you use your left hand to push open the door. You can carry almost anybody. I could, I'm a hunt, what, 190 pounds? I could carry a 300 pound man on the fireman's carry over my right shoulder. I used to carry um, couches on my right shoulder and on my head. So don't let people confuse you, okay? that oh these guys are too big there's no way Williams could have done these things okay and who's to say he did them also all by himself who's to say that his Gemini buddies didn't help him in the murders holding down these guys and maybe helping throwing them off the bridge okay I think Wayne Williams did the majority of the killing by himself the majority of the throwing them off the bridge, but there could have been other people involved, like Jim Comento, even Nathaniel Cater, Jimmy Ray Payne. This is why he's killing them off at the end, because the noose is tightening. He can feel the heat. He can see and hear the radio traffic. It's all out there. He knows he's at the end. This is why he increases the amount of killings, because he knows that the end is near. He's a hunted prey surrounded by hunters in the woods and he knows that he's surrounded so what is he doing he's going in and killing off anybody that can incriminate him Jimmy Ray Payne um, Nathaniel Cater again he probably would have got to Jim Comento if he hadn't gotten busted on that bridge And that's another fallacy that I hear that people say, you know, they say the murder stopped after Wayne Williams was stopped on that bridge. And that's true. And then other people say, even in the list, they say, oh, no, but the murders of children continued. Yeah, but not in the same way. Not in the same mode. Okay. And believe me, I looked. I looked at the papers for two or three years up until I got out of high school. And there was never, ever, ever a murder of a young black child and from the Atlanta area killed by strangulation or ligenture le uh, strangulation with a rope or a wire whose body was dumped away from the murder site in the woods or in the river. Never happened. Now, there were plenty of children 
and teenagers involved in gang disputes, domestic disputes, they got killed and dropped dead on the street from a gunshot, a stabbing, maybe got hit over the head with a pipe. Maybe the body got dumped behind a house. Maybe in a domestic dispute, got killed in the house, but none of them were ever strangled or hit over the head, killed in the same way, and the bodies dumped in the river or dumped in um, the woods. From 1981 all the way to when I left Atlanta in 19... 94? 90, yeah, 94. So the killing stopped with Wayne Williams. Now, there's nothing that would have prevented Jim Comento and maybe others of his Gemini crew to continue, but they played their card safe and they stopped because Wayne Williams had stopped. He was the leader. He was the control. Okay? All right, so we're going to stop here. And again... I'm going to put out my challenge. If you have any evidence that disputes anything I've said, that proves Wayne Williams was innocent, that proves some, uh, somebody else was involved in these murders, and I'm talking about hard facts, forensic proof. I'm not talking about, again, your grandma's, uncle's, hairdresser's dog told them that they saw so-and-so kill one of these kids or heard it from the postman or heard it from their hairdresser at work. It's got to be hard facts, not, you know, village rumor. And again, I'm making the challenge to Wayne Williams sitting in prison for 40 years. <clears throat> if you have GBI documentation like you claim and video and audio proving you're innocent that's sitting in your lawyer's office for the last five, six years... Why haven't you released it? Why are you allowing yourself to be stayed, to die in prison when you could be free? Okay? I damn sure know that I wouldn't be rotting away in prison if I knew my lawyer had GBI documents, audio, and video that proved my innocence. I'd be on the fucking phone every day to my goddamn lawyer. Or I'd get a new fucking lawyer. Okay? And because those documents don't belong to him, they belong to you. You're the client. Okay? So stop lying and telling people that all these documents exist. If it did exist, your ass would be out of prison. Okay? And then I'm going to make a appeal to Dorsey, who's the murdering cop, who says you say has evidence proving your innocence. If Dorsey had it, why is he telling the monster that he doesn't have any documentation showing you're showing your innocent? While well, he's rotting in prison too. And, you know, I keep checking that, you know, Wayne Williams Freedom Project website every couple of days and where it says evidence it's a blank screen. There's nothing. I'm waiting that maybe one day I'll check on there and there might be actually some evidence. But it, there's nothing. And I'm giving you the challenge, Dwayne Hendricks. Where's your evidence proving Wayne Williams is innocent? Are you just going to keep making the podcast circuit in the talk show circuit and build your career on his bones? Or are you going to actually put up or shut up? Your compadre, your buddy, your mentor is rotting away in prison and you got all this evidence and proof, you say. Prove it. Put up or shut up. All right, that's it, folks. I'll see you on the flip side, and we'll keep going down this list. We'll keep working this evidence. Until next time, 
It's two o'clock. Excuse me. It's seven o'clock. Do you know where Wayne Williams proving evidence that he's innocent? Evidence is? If you do, let me know. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.